Four. Oh boy. So you, every, everyone except Sheila. <laughs> you better, you better join the, the crowd. I have okay, great. Um, so Linda hasn't either. And uh, I want to share with you some of the beauty, some of the excitement of birding in Mexico, and also dispel some of the innuendo that you might have been feeling. So without further ado, because I have a lot to share, we'll continue with this program. So looking at, uh, believe it or not, that Mexico is North America's most ornithologically biodiverse country. It has uh, more than half the birds of North America. And uh, we'll look at, at that and how many birds have been in, seen in Mexico include about more than 1,100 species as opposed to the United States, which has about the same amount, but that would include all the off colonies and, and uh, the, uh, the islands of the tropical Pacific and, and others. Where does North America begin? Does it be begin at the, at the uh, Arizona border? No. <laughs> okay, so sometimes the, the bird guides say North America, but uh, they're talking about Northern North America. And we're looking at, I guess this, this Laser won't be too, uh, too helpful. But if you look at the interface with the Caribbean plate and the North American plate in this graphic, you'll see approximately where the North American plate is. But generally, North America is considered to begin at the Isthmus of Panama. So when you see a field guide to North American birds, usually they don't include all the birds in North America. It's usually Central America or Mexico or the United States, Canada, and Alaska. Could, and you, in the, could you please explain or define plate? Yeah, these plate, te those tectonic plates that make up the, uh, the world's uh, crust. And some of them are moving. For instance, look at the Pacific plate. They're all moving against each other. And the Pacific plate is pulling Baja California away from the North America. And that's what formed the Gulf of California. So look at, looking at the world as a whole, you can look at the different biogeographic faunal regions. And we're lucky here in Arizona because we're kind of at the interface of the Nearctic and the Neotropical faunal regions of the world. You can see the other ones, and there's the Wallace line out there in Indonesia, and uh, Wallacea, as, it's, as that portion of the world is called, where there's a, a different interface, but we're gonna look at the Neotropical and Nearctic portions where we are here and where Mexico's located. That's a lovely Cotinga from the, red, uh, from the uh, tropical rainforest of southeastern Mexico. So if you look at these different uh, faunal regions of the world, and this is telling, eBird is an excellent citizen science uh, medium. And, and since its found in inception in 2002, you can see that more than 10,000 species of birds have been recorded. In fact, as of a few weeks ago when I, when I started this lecture, well, a month ago or so, when I, did, when I formulated this lecture, there were 10,714 species of birds recorded on eBird. Of course, not all the birds of the world are recorded on eBird, and there's always flux because birds get lumped and split, and, and I'll talk about that. But if you look at our region, we have more than 4,000 species of birds in the neotropical region to the south of us, and our region in the north, the Neoarctic region, has the 12,000, I mean 1,200 species, roughly. But this is where it becomes interesting, endemics. So we're looking at, the, there are only three species in the America, uh, three countries in the Americas that have more than 100 endemic birds. And Mexico's one of them. If you think about Colombia, which has the most birds of any birds uh, of any country in the world, it has only 80 endemics. But Mexico has up to 128 endemic species or not found anywhere else but Mexico, depending on the taxonomic beliefs of the time. And you can see a couple of these here. The short-crested coquette, the one on the top, is considered to be the most desired to see bird in Mexico. It's only found in a very limited part of Mexico, 25 kilometers stretch of road in the Sierra Toya, which is about equidistant between Acapulco and uh, Cihuatanejo on the west coast of Mexico. And it's a wonderful area that has a reputation, but that was from the past and it's quite safe to travel in now and I bring groups down to see it. And you can see these little parrotlets also. So a newly recognized endemic, the West Mexican euphonia, used to be considered a 
a subspecies of the scrub euphonia, but I never bought that. It's bigger than it, and it has a white undertail covert, which is kind of broke, uh, kind of uh, blocked by this branch. However, it's only found on, the, and I'm going to show you some maps. There's its range on the west coast of Mexico. In fact, you can see it near Alamo, Sonora. How many people have been to Alamos? Yeah, it's, that's it's a wonderful location that can be reached pretty quickly. And uh, you can have lunch on the way and, and be there, get leave early in the morning and be there time for dinner with lunch and brood and see this bird and a number of other spectacular birds in this Pueblo Magia or Pue Pueblo Magico, the magical Pueblo of Alamos, which is a, uh, a designated by the Mexican government as a culturally significant site. A lot of people would like to see a blue-footed booby in their life. And if you go to Mexico, it's a good idea because there are 15 times more blue-footed boobies in Mexico than there are in the Galapagos Islands. With over 90,000 as opposed to 6,000. So what do you need to get to Mexico? Well, you can, I don't have to read everything to you, but these are the main credentials you need. Now, when you want to I'm not trying to encourage people to feel happy to drive their car in Mexico and start enjoying the, the spectacular friendliness, biodiversity, and good food of Mexico, and good places to stay. Plus, economically, it's a, one heck of a great place to travel when you compare it to other choices. Um, for, for instance, Europe, where a lot of Americans travel, and it's a wonderful birding destination. So you'll need a registration with your name on it. You don't need, even though it says on all the sites, you need, if, you're, if you have a lien on your car, you do not need permission from your lender. It says you do, but you don't, okay? So all you need to do is take out Mexican automobiles insurance, and then you can drive into Mexico. And uh, you'll have an, a temporary importation permit that will uh, last for six months, cost $400 if your car is uh, with, uh, under 10 years old, and you get the money back when you return it before you return the permit before you it, its expiration date. So let's look at some of the things that uh, people consider when they think about Mexico, a third world country, a dangerous country, cartels are everywhere, and you're not, you won't survive if you cross the border. And it's not true. But if you look at the, you can see that if you see the middle class percentage, it's, it's approaching what we have here in the United States. It's a, a, over 40%, and in the US it's around 50%. Look at the educational background. Mexicans are very pro-American. They like us. And the name gringo is not a disparagement. It just means we're from the North. In fact, they call Canadians gringos, <laughs> Americans gringos, and Europeans gringos, okay? But they like us. So uh, there's something called a Puesto de Control. This is a roadside stop. You'll see guys with armament. That's just the way they uh, handle their internal affairs. And they're mainly making sure you don't have illegal arms, but most of the time, and you'll see this for 700 miles south of the border, something called the no hassle zone in English. And that's where they won't bother you unless you're doing something illegal, but <laughs> they won't bother you. You have a no hassle zone from all the way from the border, well, from 22 kilometers south of the border to 700 kilometers south of the border. And that way, the, the American, I mean, the Mexicans are trying to encourage travel. So, yes? Where is 700 kilometers south of the border? Where is approximately Mazatlan. And that's a wonderful town to visit, by the way, and it's got wonderful birds, and I'll get into that because I'm gonna show you a couple of land routes that you might wanna give a try if you ever wanted to visit Mexico. So just so you know what a puesto is when you see his military or federal police, they now call them national guards or guardias nacionales. Where are the safest regions in Mexico? I'll go into that. And the US State Department warnings are highly exaggerated they don't put New York or Detroit or Southeast LA in it. <laughs> I noticed that. Okay, but let's talk about it. Everyone's thinking about the, the safety part of Mexico. So the safety issues when traveling to Mexico. It's very friendly. If you're not involved in bad things, it's highly unlikely you're gonna encounter bad things. Um, and, and here's these are FBI stats as of this year. 
and and I got one on the bottom that was the the most recent I could find. But uh, a significantly higher rate of gun violence in the U.S. as opposed to Mexico and drug and drug abuse as well. Also, Mexico has it does have a higher murder rate, twenty eight as opposed to seven out of one hundred thousand individuals. But Assaults on U.S. citizens, and including Canadians, I, put, I should put that, um, are rare. Very rare, in fact. In 2021, 75 people that were from the U.S. were killed in Mexico out of 21.73 million that visited. The vast majority of them were up to no good. Burning counts as good. In fact, when you, when you talk to, to uh, the locals, just all you have to say if you say you're bird watching, they don't understand that because you know a lot of them don't. But now ecotourism is is coming in, so they may actually understand that. But estudiamo las aves. I'm studying birds, and then they'll open the open the yard to you, open their community. Adelante, enjoy. Here's the ten safest cities in Mexico. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, my city, Puerto Vallarta, is among them. That's not in order of safety, but it's uh, Puerto Vallarta is number two. The other, the number one is uh, is Maryland in Yucatan. Let's look at the map where these are. Those little pins I put put are uh, the uh, the safest cities in Mexico. There's plenty of other safe cities. These are the ten safest. But you see, it's throughout Mexico. The southeastern part of Mexico is very safe. It's mostly rainforest and mine ruins, and has a lot of ecotourism. Most of the Yucatan is very safe. You've probably heard of some problems in Cancun. Well. Uh, cartel, cart, uh, cartel members might like to go to the beach too, but they tend to not involve themselves with in, with uh, uh, international visitors. Now, we have, Mexico's not all bad roads, okay? So <laughs> you have to take the good roads to get to the bad roads to get to the good birding. <laughs> and you'll see the red ones are toll roads. And the, the main speeds and the uh, amber-colored uh, lines are your general highways are divided, and they typically have a speed limit of 80 kilometers an hour, which is 50 miles per hour. The toll roads make travel in Mexico impressively viable by road, because you have a speed limit of 62 to, uh, to 68 miles per hour, so 100 to 110 kilometers per hour is uh, on those red roads. And now they've been parked for the last 25 uh, years on a, a major road build, building plan. Yes, Gordon. So how do you, how do you pay the toll? Is it an easy pass thing? You have to okay, you can buy an easy pass. That's right, it goes straight to your credit card, or you can pay with pesos at toll booths. They don't take dollars generally, and the reason for that is the conversion rate changes all the time. It's hard for them to change. Here's an example of a friend of mine, Fernando Romo, one of my uh, associates of Photograph Birds in our company, Berlin in Mexico. He, but this was just on a private trip recently. But if you look at this, uh, the, the toll keeper, and, and she's taking uh, the, the money, if you look at the sign below her, it talks about the conservation of jaguars in Nairi, and to watch out for them as you're driving on the road, to be careful not to run one over. Welcome to Sinaloa. <laughs> you know, that that's a wonderful uh, state. It's one of the most biodiverse states, and it's also the state that houses the uh, the reserve of Chara Pinta, or the, the um, Tuck de Jay Reserve, and also Mazatlan. It also has the home of El Chapo, of Culicon. I noticed that they built the toll road 15 kilometers away from Culicon and a big peripher periphery away from it. <laughs> so, so, and there's federal police plying those roads. I drive it all the time, and it's, uh, it's, it's nice. There's restaurants along the way. But you're going to run into some you know, roads like this. So it doesn't hurt to have high clearance. There's Claudia, my lady, um, <laughs> enjoying herself on one of these bad roads. Oh, <laughs> Chris and Mary, on a recent trip that we did last winter into Cabo Corrientes above Puerto Vallarta. You can see how biodiverse the, the vegetative component is in Mexico. Look how much tropical rainforest there is, a light green on the right-hand side. And the uh, black blotches are cloud forest, in fact. A lot of Chihuahuan and, and uh, Sonoran Desert 
is there, and you can see a lot of it is in as well in Baja California. And on the left-hand upper portion, you have the chaparral belt from California. It's a wonderful biodiverse country, and that's why you can see so many birds. So let's look at some of the highlights of birding this uh, North America, uh, the fourth most biodiverse nation on Earth, number four. Okay, so how do you find these birds? Some of the rules change in Mexico. For instance, fishing doesn't seem to work. It, do, it, it definitely works on the, on the migrants, and you have 60% of our birds winter in Mexico, so they rely on Mexico for, for nine months out of the 12 year, a 12 uh, month year. So are they their bird? Are they our birds? Or are they their birds? Those birds will be pitched out, but uh, uh, you'll have to work carefully because you'll have to work hard because there are a lot of skulkers. A lot of the species that are endemic to Mexico are um, hidden in the vegetation. You have a lot of ventriloquists among them, so you'll hear the sound over here and the birds over to your left. You have to learn all of these kind of things. And there are a lot of understory specialists, as I mentioned. However, if you can whistle a pygmy owl call, ferruginous pygmy owl, which, which is common throughout most of Mexico, and then there's some other owls like the Kalima pygmy owl at higher elevations, or the northern, what we call mountain pygmy owl, a race of northern pygmy owl, they're found. If you can use those three calls, and chances are in Mexico, you'll be the only birder in your area, so you're not going you're not gonna harass these birds too much, they'll come to you. Mexico is 70% mountainous and helps explain this endemism because I, mountains are like islands. We have here in Southeast Arizona, the northern extremity of the extension of the Sierra Madre Occidental, the western mountains of Mexico. And those are the Chiricahua, the Huachuca, the Santa Rita, and the Pajarito, and the, uh, and the Santa Catalina Mountains. These are the Mexican mountains that are also called mountain islands, in, uh, mountain islands in desert seas. There's even a book of that title from the 80s. 70% of the, of the, I mean, most of the human population, I should say, is in the central volcanic belt. Since this laser isn't working too well, I'm just gonna show you where it is. So here's Puerto Vallarta, where I live. Mexico City is over here. Guadalajara is over here. And Veracruz is here. So in this portion lies 80% of Mexico's population, which means a lot of Mexico will be open, unspoiled habitat. There are some cows. <laughs> okay. It's also, it's the record holder for wrens and reptiles. And look at that number of wrens, 33 types of wrens in Mexico. So everywhere you go, you're gonna have certain species of wren. This is a spotted wren, which is a montane species. And you can find it pretty close to here up in the Ikora region. Here's its range, and you can see where, where Tucson is as opposed to the northern dots on the, uh, this eBird map. Quite a few of them within a few hours uh, drive south of the border. Especially in this area, Ikora. Here's a, and you can st spend the night in Hermosillo. It has a, you can stay at a Holiday Inn or, or a Mexican chain and have some nice, a nice meal and then the next day drive half the day and get to Ikora, burning your way up to the pine oak woodlands. And you can see to the right of that is a, is a nature uh, preserve for thick-billed parrots. And to the north of it, north of the town of Madeira, and I'll get into this and later in, the, is another reserve for thick-billed parrots, which, which as you know, is extirpated from Arizona. They tried to reintroduce them, but without success. And I'll talk about that later. So more ornithological stats, and you can read this, but uh, basically the same amount of birds as you have in the whole uh, holdings of the United States, which is seven times bigger than Mexico, five times bigger than Mexico. Over 400 species of birds occur in Mexico that do not occur north of the border. So you have a lot of, you're at the, neo, the tip of the neotropical ice, iceberg, so, so to speak. 128 endemic bird species, but Mexico is also the, you know, uh, the, the second most populous country in, in North America. It has 133 million people, as opposed to the U.S., which has 200 million more. But uh, a lot of them are concentrated in that, that one band that I pointed out. And this, look at this, this flame color tangent. Is something wrong with the, something must be wrong with the color on this, on this monitor, you think so? Oh, well, there's different races. 
Okay, so this is the southeastern Andes. For the eastern part of Mexico, and down in the southern Andes, it goes all the way into South, Central America, all the way down to Costa Rica and Panama. It's red. Here's our race on the left there, which is kind of russet on the kind of orangey, rich, almost reddish on the head, but fades to uh, 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 some more somber orange tone uh, as you look at the ventral portion of the bird. And here's the range of that bird. You can see something goes into the, in the United States. When I first tried to see one in 1983, the first record or second record for the U.S., and I did succeed, we drove uh, 700 miles from uh, Los Angeles, Sherman Oaks in, in Los Angeles County to uh, Cape Fear Canyon to see one of the first plane called the Tanagers. Here's, there was a convention in 2002 of uh, what, what's called the, the Convention on Mega Diversity Con Countries, and here they are, but in, in uh, alphabetical order. If you look, number one is, is Brazil. Well, that's a huge country, bigger than the continental United States. Number two, Indonesia. Thousands of equatorial islands, most of them highly imperiled. It's one of the most populated parts of the world. But a lot of endemism there, too. Number three, China. That might surprise you. But a lot of China is tropical. Um, and then uh, Mexico is number four. So the fourth most mega diverse country on Earth. If you look in red, of all of these countries, they met in Cancun, Mexico, and they pledged to help each other conserve their biological resources, their biodiversity. The U.S. was the only standout among them. Let's go on some rides. So these are some of the exciting places that you can reach on a nice uh, two-week trip, three-week trip, depending, or you know, if you want to go for a few days, Puerto Penasco. Let's take a look at them. So this, uh, I'm just, there's, there's hundreds of these throughout Mexico, but these are the ones that I highly recommend you think about if you want to return to Mexico by your own power with your own private vehicle, which is, hell, I mean, I'm putting myself out of business because I, <laughs> I run a tour company, right? But, but I want you to enjoy what I enjoy. And of course, if you want to, to uh, go on trips, you can, all, there's a lot of companies that, that offer that. The first one, if you look at the, the distances, not too bad. In a few hours, you can get to Puerto Penasco, or what's called, we, um, the Americans call it Rocky Point, but it really translates to Boulder Point. Driving through the Sonoran Desert, Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument, and then going through the formalities at the border and ending up 60 miles south of the border at this beautiful place uh, with, with a number of embayments. And you can start to see some birds that are hard to see in Arizona. And you'll also reach the Gulf of California. And if you've ever hiked to Mount Wrightson, over 9,000 feet in, in the Santa Rita Mountains above Madera Canyon, you can see the Gulf of California from up there on clear days. I've done it many times. Well, if you ever want to see bluefoot boobies with blue feet, <laughs> instead of gray feet, and, uh, and see them in numbers. You can see these, these uh, boulders at the point there. You'll see blue-footed boobies. You'll see them um, spelled, uh, you can see this is, the, this is one uh, in the family Sulidae, and they're, and they're in the Pelic Pelicaniformes genus, so, uh, um, family, sorry. So the Pelicaniformes, and they have tapered wings, tapered tail, tapered bill, ossified colon, so for diving into the water, so a bony reinforced beak, and their, even their ocular condyle is, uh, is bony reinforced. And for hitting the, because they dive from roughly 100 feet into the water in mass to capture fish that they can see from above. There's the range of blue footed booby. Um, you can see a lot of them are concentrated out there in the northern Gulf of California. So you can see them you can spend, you can go to Lukeville, have lunch at one of those little greasy spoons in Lukeville, and then drive 60 miles and be in the, at the ocean and see bluefoot boobies, same day. Another specialty of the Gulf of California, yellow-footed gull, a huge gull, 
it's, it's rent is primarily the Gulf of California. It also in the southern part of Baja California or Baja Sur, it's also found on the Pacific Coast. It goes in the summertime up to the Salton Sea, but fewer and fewer all the time, and some, some to San Diego. And, uh, but they're rare birds north of the border, common on the coast of, of uh, Puerto Penasco, or Rocky Point. And you can see some unusual forms of the savanna sparrow, which uh, I predict will be split eventually, the large-billed sparrow. Kind of looks like a combination between a female house sparrow and a, and a house finch and a, and, a, and a savanna sparrow all together. It's a bigger bird. It's in, it's, it inhabits, you know, a salicornia and, and, and other places, mangrove. There's a few mangroves up there too, but they're, you know, one foot. And red shade groups are pretty common in that area too. So you can enjoy the embayments. A lot of expatriates have built houses in that area, so there are nice restaurants, hotels. But if you really want to get to, you know, real Mexican birding, tropical birding in Mexico, let me go back. Oops. Back we go. Then we'll take this route, and uh, you know, you might want to stop at Hermosillo. There's a place called uh, the in Centro Investigaciones de Sonora. It's the sister institution of the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. Great birding on site plus a lot of displays of Sonoran wildlife and birds. What's the name of it? It's, uh, the, it'll, it, says it's the, it translates to the uh, Central Investigation of Sonoran Wildlife. So uh, you can look it up, it's, uh, it's, it, but there's signs when you get to, to Yermo Seal, you'll see a big sign and, and you'll be able to follow those signs or put it on your Google map because your phone will probably work in Mexico if you alert your company. And then we can travel into Bahia Quino, off to the uh, west, or all the way to Ikora, which I talked about with the spotted wrens and the thick-billed parrots up there, and then go down, down to San Carlos and, and uh, Guaymas in this region, a lovely area, a lot of expatriates living there. And you can go to Ciudad Obregón and then go to the magical Pueblo of Alamos, then to El Fuerte, which is one of the three regions of Sonora with rivers. So uh, it's a, a wonderful area, and I'll get into that. And then all the way down to Topo Lombampo on the Gulf of California, where you can watch tropic birds. At some of these places, uh, they have wonderful hotels and they offer boating trips. This guy's name is Michelangelo, and he's he by day is a, I got him into birding, and now he started his own birding company with this river. And, and then at night he's Zorro at the hotel, at the nearby hotel. <laughs> he's a terrific guy. And this is a place you can see crane hawks readily. So by the river, you'll see gray hawks and black hawks like we have here, common black hawk. But you'll also see crane hawks with their bright red eyes and bright red feet. If you go to Topo Lombampo, not only will you stay at a nice hotel and go swimming when it's hot because it's a lot like Arizona down there. Um, in the summertime, and it's quite pleasant in the wintertime, you can take boats out to Pietra Blanca, which is 25 kilometers offshore, and see a colony of red-billed tropic birds, in addition to boobies and, and uh, yellow-footed gulls. You'll watch pelicans plunge diving in the lagoons with a backdrop of organ pipe cacti. That's a, kind of a juxtaposition you don't get every day. And see, you'll start encountering incredible endemics like the purplish back jay. It's a monster-sized jay, too. It's a, almost as big as, as our crow. And it's uh, got these beaming yellow eyes. 